Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Presenting to you the daily quiz for 22nd of November 2022. But before we begin, let me remind you to join our Telegram channel so you can stay up to date with all the current affairs relevant for your examination. And also to get to know about all our new initiatives, do join our official Telegram channel and the link to the Telegram channel is given in the description box below. Now let us begin and take a look at the first question for today. Consider the following statements. In case of difference of opinion amongst the election commissioners and or or the chief election commissioner, the matter is decided by the chief election commissioner. Number two, the chief election commissioner is appointed by the president and holds the office during the pleasure of the president. Number three, the constitution has debarred the retiring election commissioners from any further appointment by the government. How many of the given statements is or are incorrect? What is the context? According to this article in the PIB today, Sri Arun Goel, a retired IAS officer of 1985 Punjab cadre, has assumed charge as the new election commissioner of India. It is in this context that we have taken up this question for discussion. See, the election commission is a permanent and an independent body established by the Indian constitution to ensure free and fair elections in the country. The constitution of India states that the election commission will consist of the chief election commissioner and such number of other election commissioners, if any, as the president may fix from time to time. And the appointment of the chief election commissioner and other election commissioners will be made by the president. At present, the election commission has been functioning as a multi-member body consisting of three election commissioners. That is, the chief election commissioner and two other election commissioners. All these three members of the election commission of India have equal powers and receive equal salary, equal allowances and other perquisites which are similar to those of a judge of a supreme court. Right? They hold office for a term of 6 years or until they attain the age of 65 years, whichever is earlier, and also can resign at any time or also can be removed before the expiry of their term. Right? Now coming back to our question. We discussed that the chief election commissioner and the election commissioners have equal powers. So statement number 1 becomes incorrect. In case of a difference of opinion amongst the election commissioners and or, or the chief election commissioner, the matter is decided by the majority and not by the chief election commissioner. Coming to statement number 2. Yes, the chief election commissioner is appointed by the president. But the second part of the statement is wrong. Why? Because the chief election commissioner can be removed from his office in the same manner and on the same grounds as the judge of a supreme court. So statement number 2 also becomes incorrect. Now coming to statement number 3. Statement number 3 is also incorrect because the constitution has not debarred the retiring election commissioners from any further appointment by the government. So the right answer to our question here would be option C all three statements because all three statements are incorrect. Here's a task for you for today. The task is to let me know the qualifications, if any, prescribed by the constitution for the election commissioners. Do let me know in the comment section. Moving on to question number two. Which of the following is or are zoonotic diseases? Number one, swine flu. Number two, salmonellosis. Number three, brucellosis. Number four, African swine fever, number 5, yellow fever. What is the context? This article in the Hindu newspaper today talks about the outbreak of African swine fever in some farms in Idukki district of Kerala. In this context, let us discuss about zoonotic diseases. So what is this zoonotic disease? According to the World Health Organization, Zoonosis or zoonotic diseases are those diseases and infections which are naturally transmitted between vertebrate animals and human beings. These can be bacterial, viral as well as parasitic diseases. Right? So any disease which can be naturally transmitted between animal and man is known as a zoonotic disease. For example, anthrax, brucellosis, salmonellosis, 
प्लेग आर एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ बैक्टीरियल जोनोसिस रेबीज आर्बो वायरस इन्फेक्शन एंड येलो फीवर आर ऑल वायरल जोनोसिस डीप माइकोसिस हिस्टोप्लास्मोसिस वुड बी एग्जाम्पल ऑफ फंगल जोनोसिस राइट नाउ कमिंग बैक टू आर क्वेश्चन इज स्वाइन फ्लू जोनोटिक येस इट इज इट इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट ग्लोबल हेल्थ कंसर्न कॉज बाय स्वाइन ओरिजिन इन्फ्लुएंजा वायरस which can be transmitted from animals to humans so swine flu is zoonotic disease as we already discussed salmonellosis and brucellosis are both bacterial zoonoses so these two become correct coming to african swine fever please remember that african swine virus is not a zoonotic disease while it can affect both farm raised pigs and wild pigs it does not pose a health hazard to humans so this is not a zoonosis yellow fever as we've already discussed is a zoonosis so except for four all the other diseases mentioned here are zoonotic diseases hence option c would be the right answer you must have heard of the kaisenur forest disease do let me know if this is a zoonotic disease moving on to question number 3 consider the following statements with respect to pm kisan scheme It is a central sector scheme implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare. Number 2. The scheme is meant for small and marginal farmers having land holding up to 2 hectares. Number 3. The beneficiaries receive a lump sum of rupees 6000 per year transferred into their bank accounts through direct benefit transfer mode. How many of the given statements is or are incorrect? What is the context? This article in the PIB today talks about PM Kisan scheme and hence this question government policies and welfare schemes their provisions become very important for your prelims exam do read the question carefully before you mark the answers now let us discuss more about this particular scheme that is PM Kisan as we discuss the options see PM Kisan stands for Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi It was launched in the year 2019 to supplement the financial needs of land holding farmers. And you must note that this scheme is central sector scheme with 100% funding from the government of India and it is implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. So statement number 1 becomes correct. The primary objective of this scheme is to supplement the financial needs of small and marginal farmers. But this scheme has been an evolving scheme. Initially, it was meant for small and marginal farmers having land holding up to 2 hectares. But the scope of the scheme has been extended to cover all the land holding farmers. So statement number 2 becomes incorrect. But please remember here that certain categories of higher economic status farmers are excluded from the scheme. Now, under the scheme, financial benefit of rupees six thousand per year is transferred to the bank accounts of farmer families through direct benefit transfer. So, statement number three here might appear as if it is right. But wait, please remember that six thousand transferred to the farmers' accounts. is not a lump sum this rupees 6000 per year is transferred into their bank accounts in three equal installments that is every four months there is a transfer of rupees 2000 to the bank account of farmers families across the country through direct benefit transfer mode so statement number 3 also becomes incorrect therefore the right answer to this question would be option b two statements only because the question is asking us for incorrect statements moving on to question number 4 which of the given statements best describes total fertility rate option a it is the number of live births per 1000 persons in a population in a given year option b it is the average number of children expected to be born per woman during her entire span of reproductive period option c it is the rate at which women are replaced by daughters who will have children option d it is the total number of children born in a country in a given year divided by its population in that year what is the context this article in the indian express newspaper today talks about two significant demographic events where china will see an absolute decline in its population and india will surpass china's population It is in this context that we've picked up this question on the concept of total fertility rate. See, 
total fertility rate is the average number of children expected to be born per woman during her entire span of reproductive period. Let me explain this to you. A reproductive age female is one who is between 15 to 49 years of age, right? These are the childbearing years for her. Now, total fertility rate represents the average number of children a woman would potentially have if she were to fast forward through all her childbearing years in one single year under all the age specific fertility rates for that year. But please note that this is not based on any real group of women. It is not based on counting up the total number of children actually born over their lifetime but it is an estimate or a forecast. The fertility rate is not a measure of how many children each woman in a specific area has. But instead, it is based on an average number of children that a woman could potentially have throughout her lifetime. And this fertility rate is expressed as a number of children per woman. A total fertility rate of 2.1 per woman is called replacement level fertility. So, this is the rate at which a given population is able to produce enough offsprings to replace itself considering that there is no immigration. So, this is known as replacement level fertility, right? Now, a TFR of above 2.1 shows increasing population while that of below 2.1 shows decreasing population. So, coming back to our question, the right answer to our question here would be option B. It is the average number of children expected to be born per woman during her entire span of reproductive period. Now, let us take up a previous year question from prelims paper 2017. In India, if a species of tortoise is declared protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, what does it imply? Option A. It enjoys the same level of protection as the tiger. Option B. It no longer exists in the wild. A few individuals are under captive protection and now it is impossible to prevent its extinction. Option C. It is endemic to a particular region of India. Option D. Both B and C stated above are correct in this context. See, to answer this question, you must know about the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. This act provides for protection of animals, birds and also plants. At this point itself, you can make a guess that B, C and D cannot be the correct answers. However, let us understand this. This particular act, that is the Wildlife Protection Act, has six schedules with different degrees of protection. Schedule 1 enjoys the highest protection and Tiger is also covered under Schedule 1. So, option A would be the right answer here to this question. Now, let us take up the fact of the day for today, which is development of Great Nicobar. What is the context? Recently, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change gave environmental clearance for an ambitious development project on the Great Nicobar Island. Let us discuss more about this in detail in our fact of the day segment today. See, under this ambitious development project, a greenfield city has been proposed. The project will include an international container transshipment terminal, a greenfield international airport, a power plant and a township for the personnel who will implement the project. The port will be controlled by the Indian Navy while the airport will have military and civilian functions. This project will cost a whopping 72,000 crore and will be implemented in three phases over the next 30 years. It is expected that this project will help Great Nicobar become a major player in cargo transshipment. Now let us talk about the Great Nicobar. See, the Great Nicobar is the southernmost of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Indira point on the southern tip of the Great Nicobar Island is the southernmost point in India. It is at a less than 150 km distance from the northernmost island of the Indonesian archipelago. And the Great Nicobar Island has two national parks, a biosphere reserve and the Champagne and Nicobaris tribal people. Right? While this island has tourism potential, the government through this project is trying to leverage the locational advantage of the island for economic and strategic reasons. What are the economic and strategic advantages you may ask? 
See, owing to its location, the International Container Transshipment Terminal can potentially become a hub for cargo ships travelling on this route. With increasing Chinese assertion and activities in the Bay of Bengal and also the Indo-Pacific region, this project has great importance for national security and also for consolidation of the Indian Ocean region. But there are some concerns attached with this project. The environmentalists are concerned about the ecological damage that this massive infrastructure development could do in this ecologically sensitive area. It will also lead to increased runoff and sediment deposits in the ocean which could impact the coral reefs. So what is the way forward? One way forward is translocation of these coral reefs. While this project is important from national security perspective and also has strategic importance, all the aspects including the impact that it could have on the tribals as well as the ecological sensitivity of this region must be carefully examined. That is all for today. Thank you for being with us. Keep watching and keep learning.